I've been a fan of your playing for a while and I was eagerly awaiting the, the album and I really, really like it. There's a moment in uh, Learn No See, the reprise, um, and it goes da 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 you know, yeah. that's easily my favorite moment of the whole record. <laughs> And oh, I don't know you. why or what it is, but it, I'm deeply touched by this moment. It's really a special moment for me. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And also, the second chord to me is like a B sus chord. When you play the melody at first, you know, of the mm -hmm. first part, okay. but with the D in the melody later on, it becomes a minor sound. And I'm usually, it, it always surprises me. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, I know. I actually, because this song is uh, in an altered tuning, I didn't write the chords down. So I'm like, <laughs> it's really funny. Yeah. I mean, I heard the voicings, but it's really nice to hear that you uh, saw the like connection to the melodies and chords and everything. Yeah. How did you come? I mean, the song uh, Learn No See, seem, to me, it seems like it's growing always. Mm -hmm. uh, when I heard it for the first time and it was on the Instagram video mm. that you did like mm. years ago. Yeah. And um, I mean, come on, the song is a hit. It's it's, a, it's an incredible <laughs> song. Um, but it seems to me like every time I hear it and then when we played it also together and then the album comes, comes out and then I hear you at Clang, I'm always hearing different sections mm. and then there's the reprise. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about the history of that song? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I guess, yeah, as you said, it started out with this like a solo recording, just me playing a classical guitar, you know, um, about it's I think more than two years ago. And mm. then actually I didn't play it at all because it was, you know, it wasn't a jazzy song and I played with my trio and I felt like it's not a song I can play. And then you asked me to play for this uh, Pablo Held Meets series, right? And then it was the first time I played it with a band. Mm -hmm. And I was actually very inspired uh, from that moment on to play that song. Especially some of my friends heard it uh, first time and they were like, oh, this is my favorite song of yours, why don't you play? <laughs> I was okay, I, I guess I should play it more. And from there on, um, yeah, I played it also uh, in a trio setting with the singer and saxophone. And then I thought I'm going to record it for the album. And yeah, I heard it kind of, I I kind of heard this a bit Bjork uh, vibe. So I wanted to have the strings and kind of build the song up because it's kind of a repetitive song. So I felt it needs something more. So yeah, I'm always trying to figure something out new for, uh, for that song when I play it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also loved on the on the record, like you have strings there, but then they play in unison. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that, you know, because everybody's like, ah, oh, now I have strings. I'm gonna put like all the yeah. uh, the harmony that I know into what they play, and mm -hmm. it's gonna be super full. And mm -hmm. usually, when pianists or also guitarists write for strings, sometimes the strings take up the uh, more or less the because it comes so much out of their perspective, mm -hmm. um, they take up the the role of the guitarist or the pianist a little bit too much sometimes mm -hmm. I feel. Mm. Yeah. And just the, the way you just use them and in, in like a, they do these uh, glissandi and yeah, you know, yeah. they play in yeah. unison. Mm -hmm. That was cool. Oh, thank you. How did you come up with those melodies that they were supposed to play? Um, well, first of all, I had this idea that they're gonna be like a voice. I didn't want them to be like, you know, play full chords and stuff. I actually had this paper where I wrote down the whole form and then I wrote options for each section, what could the strings do? But mm -hmm. then it was just, uh, the strings first play in the empty spaces of the melody. So it's a response to the melody and the glissandos are just uh, this kind of, uh, I don't know, in classical music, there's this term or like a, not a cry, but something where a melody goes down and something, uh, it's kind of a, a breath, you know, and mm -hmm. it's like, uh, uh, this 
kind of thing. So it's supposed to be that. And uh, note-wise, it's just very simple notes and intervals of thirds and fifths and stuff yeah. like this. Kind of also a bit of Radiohead inspired. <laughs> I was inspired <laughs> a bit by Radiohead or the melody, something I heard Radiohead in my head yeah. too. So. But when did you have the idea to write that reprise for the song? Um, I think I was just playing Learn No See, the first song, and uh, somehow, you know, sometimes I <laughs> wander on, like I'm playing and I'm okay, uh, I continue playing something, and then I came up with these chords, and usually when I play chords or I compose, I just immediately start singing melodies in my head. Uh, not in my head, actually, out loud. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, and I was just playing these chords and singing this melody. And I don't know, it seemed natural that this song resolves into something more peaceful. And yeah, that's actually how I just wrote it. It was this small idea that I wanted to put somewhere. So I attached it to this uh, song, Learn No See. Beautiful. It's really my favorite song on the on the album. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. And um, there's also something about the sound that seems to be different on the reprise. Mm. Was that a conscious choice or how did that happen? I think, uh, yeah, I was quite conscious because uh, it's, I think it's a very spacious, not spacious, but um, there's only the strings playing one unison line and the voice joins them and there's only these very sparse sounds of the drums so it was kind of a i think there's a lot of reverb both on the voice and uh the yeah. strings because also we recorded in the studio 150 which is if you it can be a very wet room you know it's mm -hmm. there's a lot of reverb and also dry you can make it very dry room but for this song it was very reverby and it was a conscious choice i remember with yuri sal yeah. uh, we were checking uh, out he added a bit of reverb to the voice and he was like okay more tom yorky you know and yeah, like yeah, yeah. adding more reverb and stuff so it was fun yeah yes yeah, beautiful he's a great guy huh he, is, he yeah, has yeah. great uh, great yeah. ears yeah and super fast with editing also yeah. and uh, just super fast in general and you don't really seem to notice the sound check i always like that <laughs> yeah yeah you mentioned radiohead mm -hmm. there's also something about the pattern of the of learn no see that reminds me a little bit of radiohead as well mm -hmm. like w w what's your um when you think of radiohead and your the influence that they had on you mm -hmm. what are the songs or the albums that matter the most to you or uh, i guess I I started listening to Radiohead when I was a uh, more a kid. I was like 12 until 16. I really liked them. But because it was I think a kid develops a lot. I mean not a kid but more a teen develops a lot in those years and it's just becomes ingrained in my subconscious almost. So this music it's I don't know, it's kind of a first discovery for me in music that mm -hmm. I really like and I really liked OK Computer this album yeah and Kid A and when R In Rainbows came out I also really liked it mm -hmm. and also the latest stuff is nice and Tom York's solo album oh uh, yeah the Eraser, Eraser. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah it's really great and also Anima the latest stuff is really nice and so it's I don't know how it inspired me um, I guess in many ways <laughs> but mm -hmm. I think I'm not really so much aware of how it uh, comes out in my own playing or how I compose or hear harmony mm. or guitar patterns. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. For a record like this, which is your first album, what was, how did you prepare for it? What happened in your mind or in your practice mm. when the album recording came nearer and nearer and nearer? Yeah. Yeah, it was... It was a big deal, this recording. So a few months before, uh, I was rehearsing very often with the band and the strings. Uh, and yeah, it was just a lot of preparation in order to feel as comfortable as we can with the songs and uh, improvising over them and just the feeling of the music to get as close as we can to uh, nice sounding music. 
So it was a lot of preparation uh, the months before. And yeah, I was also in my practice, I was spending a lot of hours just uh, focusing on those songs and trying uh, to dissect uh, many melodies actually also, because how I often practice improvisation is taking the melody of the uh, piece I wrote and then taking small bits and maybe sequencing it or I don't know, playing it in patterns or stuff like this. So I was practicing that a lot also. Do you want to show this? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Like it's just a, sm a small example of how you okay, go about small. it. Okay, super small thing. Maybe uh, I have this, I have this song, Seymour Filling the Void, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very percussive thing. And it started just from one riff and how I would practice. Maybe I'll show just one idea or something. Mm -hmm. So this song, it's just one riff, so it's something like this. Yeah. And the, then the solo changes are very simple. So I would just practice because a big thing of this song is double stop. So I would just practice through the song. It's very like, <laughs> it sounds maybe not great, but I would practice, you know, playing double stops and making melodies. It's very sounds a bit Jimi Hendrixy, but I would no, practice this. I would practice this or yeah, this song also has this line. So I would practice these patterns of one, two, three, five over it and sequencing it and starting from different notes of the yeah, scale or something like that. So mm -hmm. yeah. can you show this? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> it's a bit boring, but yeah. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's just something yeah. like this. So you you re reverse the direction. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Displace um, it. Yeah, and displace it, and maybe play it in groups of five or something like this. Mm -hmm. And yeah of course when i listen to music i hear some stuff and then i'm like okay i could try this song uh this idea from maybe i was listening to kurt rosenwinkel's blue line and then it has also this uh sequenced or i don't know it has these groups of fives i think i don't remember precisely but i was listening to it and i was like okay i should try this idea on my song so i sometimes do that also mm -hmm. okay. yeah that's cool Thank you for checking out the podcast. If you enjoyed these conversations, please join me on patreon.com slash Pablo Held for more educational videos on various musical topics, early access to episodes, lead sheets, online hangouts, listening sessions, music recommendations, band camp discount, and more behind the scenes stuff from the podcast. The generous support of my Patreons helps me to pay for the running costs of the podcast and it also helps me to keep it going into the future. Thank you so much, and let's get back to the episode. And also, I mean, that's the technical side, but what happens yeah. on the, you know, emotional or spiritual side? Yeah, I guess, to be honest, I think I was a bit stressed and I put too much pressure on myself for this recording. Um, but spiritually, I would say it's just a big, uh, I don't know. I guess I was just enjoying each rehearsal when I played with the band. And it's mm -hmm. kind of a, I don't know. It's just, we're all playing their music for one for one reason, because we all love music. And then it's coming together. This music is coming together. And it's just, it's just a very happy feeling, you know? Um, and yeah, I don't know. And then when the recording came, it was different for you, or? I mean, it was, it felt, it felt great. It felt both very intense because we were two days from 10 in the morning until 10 in the night just playing. So it was very, it kind of, it felt like we gained momentum while we were playing. It was, we mm -hmm. just didn't want to stop playing. It's like, okay, this is nice. And of course, getting used to the studio and the sound and how it's to play you know, when you hear everything you do so clearly. And so it was different. So mm. it was a great learning experience also. Uh, oh, yeah. And, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also with the first recording, you think about, oh, yeah. okay, this is my first kind of portray of myself yeah, and my music exactly. into the music and everybody's going to go back to the first album even if you do 20 they're like okay that's what's the first album that you did yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. that's yeah i think that's why i was a bit scared or I put mm -hmm. a lot of pressure because yeah i don't know <laughs> exactly what you say so yeah okay would be nice if we could skip the first recording and just <laughs> already uh, release the second recording mm. of our mm. discography. <laughs> yeah. But had you, have you been recording yourself a lot uh, before that? Recording rehearsals or gigs? Mm. Have you been doing that? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, I think especially because the drummer I worked with he always recorded all the rehearsals so mm -hmm. i got it from him uh that i'm also recording sometimes but he always sent the recordings so it was nice i didn't always listen to them but when i felt um, that you know we could improve on stuff or i wanted to you know look back and think what could i not fix but change and stuff mm -hmm. so that was helpful to listen to those recordings and uh, yeah and also gigs i think it's really nice to record because it's nice after some time to, if it feels like it was a really bad gig or maybe a really good gig or something like this, then it's really nice after a few weeks to go back and actually have a, like a reality check, you know, totally. <laughs> because it's, it's helpful, especially because we can be so criticizing and so harsh on ourselves, how we played. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's nice to go back and see maybe it wasn't so bad after all. And yeah, yeah, I don't know. Or you thought you were great. Yeah, and also. You realize, yeah. I kind of sound like somebody who thinks he's doing yeah, <laughs> or she's also. doing a great job yeah. at something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm always fascinated by that. Like, how can we get both of those images more in sync with each other? That it. Yeah. And I think like recording yourself and listening to it a lot is mm. is a great way to do it, because then after a while, in the moment you can go like i'm about to do the thing again mm -hmm. yeah I see. <laughs> i'm not gonna yeah. do it yeah i'm gonna do something else now yeah. L learn you know yeah going back to learn no see what's wh what happened there was an on clang you did an incredible interlude on a pedal <laughs> uh, um what happened there? <laughs> I, no, I, I, I'm, I'm talking about it because um, yeah. I want to talk about it because it's, um, it connects me back to what I said before. You know, mm -hmm. the song yep. keeps on growing and it's different each time. Yeah. Yeah, I think because I was playing this song in solo, so I was like, okay, what can I do to extend it or have kind of a guitar moment more because... Uh, yeah, it's just me singing and playing very simple lines. So I thought, okay, I'll do something else. And I was just, I don't know, again, I was just playing the song and I was playing around the riff and stuff. And I came up with this, I'll just play an open D note and then play some high voicings. And yeah, I don't know, it was, I came up with, with that stuff by ear, of course, because yeah, it's a different tuning. So it's um, hard to... Yeah, it's actually I like it about playing in a different tuning that I don't know the notes about, you know, at notes, mm -hmm. in which I see because it's I'm just playing by ear and finding stuff by ear. It's not OK. I see a D flat, I don't know, dominant or something. It's everything's by ear. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you sometimes um, then develop those things that you've learned through different tunings? where you didn't know what you were doing mm -hmm. into something where you kind of try to learn it and then to apply it on the traditional tuning? Um, I think not really yet, because the things that can be done on like alternate tunings are so specific and it's always for me it involves a lot of open strings which then I can't really emulate or I can't imitate on mm. the normal standard tuning. So I still haven't found a way how to combine like different tunings and standard tunings. So mm -hmm. yeah, I have to work on it. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, I really admire the the way you um, take a standard or a well-known song and then do your own thing with it without, you know, it's not, it's never on, you know, like on the nose or like I'm doing my own thing with the standard. It's mm -hmm. so natural and it, it's always, it seems to me, it's like a tribute to the original song like i can feel mm. the love for the original mm. song i can see mm. why you want to do mm. that song mm -hmm. but it's totally you mm. and that's i think that's something that a lot of people are struggling with or tr struggling mm. finding their own way to do it so um tell me a little bit how how you worked on that and how um how it evolved over time Yeah, um, yeah. thank you uh, for the words. And I guess it's very important for me with standards, uh, playing that kind of music, it's really important to have a emotional connection or a, the love for the song. Uh, yeah, so I always play songs I really love and that's what I enjoy most from the standards. Uh, I guess you're talking about also the songs I played in the solo set or... Mm -hmm. or, okay. Or yeah, I mean, there's "I Loves You, Porgy." There's yeah, yeah, yeah. "The Flowers yeah. Love Something," and then yeah, yeah. "Black Is the Color." And oh, okay, what yeah. else? There's just, there's more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's how I got this uh, my own approach to them. It's also the fact that I always kind of was aware that I'm not gonna be able to play like traditional jazz guitar. You know, I knew that even though I really love Jim. Why, Jim. why would you say that? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I like, I mean, just not traditional jazz guitar, but uh, I'm saying uh, a beep up. I don't know, a bit not beep up, but I know I wouldn't play like Joe Pass, you know, or, right. yeah. or Wes Montgomery, even mm -hmm. though I love them. I really love them. They're so great, but I knew that I'm not able to do it. Or even to play like my teachers here at Amsterdam, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not even though I tried, I'm not able to do that. So I guess what I did is just, I don't know, play around with the songs in the way I like to, in a way that, I don't know, I play rhythmically the stuff that I enjoy or harmonically I choose the voicings that I think are nice and mm -hmm. I enjoy. So it's just also a lot working with just playing the instrument and uh, with hear with my own uh, hearing and playing the things I hear in my head and yeah mm -hmm. I don't know can you we go into detail about like the, your arrangement of a flower is a love something mm -hmm. maybe with the guitar as well so okay. I can show how you came up with it because okay. I love like I love that the both first A sections are different okay like also harmonically uh, you know yeah uh ah yeah well there's okay i'll try to do it <laughs> um i think it i think it all started with this um just a pattern uh, that i was playing and i wasn't even thinking that i'm gonna play a flowers a love something it was just this <laughs> started with this kind of 3-4, 6-8 pattern uh, and then I thought okay flower is a love something starts with uh, the B7 chord but then I played uh, the B7, B7 triad on top of an A bass note yeah. so that's the first A and it's actually just triads you know it's a yeah. C sharp try it, B try it, C sharp try it, and B try it. Just moved around, and then I go back to the riff, and yeah, and then it's again, and then it goes to the B seven. And here I thought I would have just voicings with an open string because B, B can be, B can be left as an open string, and then it's like a extension for the. B7, which is mm. the original chord. So I just moved the bass notes and left the B ringing, and that's how I came up with it. 
Yeah, but mm-hmm. how do you look at those chords? Yeah. I was, how do you understand these chords? Okay. I guess how I worked with those chords first, it's I'm just looking at the melody and the bass note, and then I fill mm-hmm. up the rest of the notes because guitar has kind of, it feels it has limited options. You know, it's mostly five or maximum six notes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I look at them like that. And this chord for me, it's just a B, B triad with the sharp five and then with the flat nine as the open string. And then it moves. B or do you yeah. mean B flat? Oh, B flat, B flat, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was wondering yeah. about that, okay. Yeah, sorry, B flat. So this would be the third, the first, the sharp five and then flat nine. And then it just moves, the melody moves, and the bass moves too. Okay, and this doesn't sound like a B flat dominant <laughs> at <No>. all. <laughs> but but there's like notes from the B flat seven chord. It's just a, it's a flat, um, it's a no sharp nine in the bass. Wait, I'm confused now. Yeah, sharp nine. To me, it sounds like a D flat seven <laughs> it, chord. It, yeah, it actually is. <laughs> But I see it as a B flat seven all the time, just with the different yeah. notes from the chord uh, mm-hmm. in places. So I see it that way. And this is just a diminished chord. And then it goes D flat uh, sus. But doesn't the isn't there a, a B flat in the in the bass on the recording um, when you play this the high C? And then there's a B flat in the in the bass. Could be because there's also a bass player, so yeah, he probably played a B flat or something. I'm not uh-huh. sure. Okay. <laughs> But yeah. Um. Ah. Or wait, I think maybe I play a B flat and the bass player plays the melody. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's it. Yeah. That's what happened. Yeah. So it's. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So it's just a yeah E flat sus with still an open with also the third and uh, the four mm-hmm. with a B flat in the bass yeah mm-hmm. two and for the A flat seven it's kind of the mm-hmm. same I looked at the melody and the bass notes and they and moved them yeah and this is a, yeah weird chord. And then the D flat is this chord. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, chords with open uh, strings because I like that sound, kind of yeah. very resonating mm-hmm. sound. So yeah, yeah. Should I continue? Or? Of course, yeah. <laughs> okay, and then the yeah the ending. And here it's just, you know, the traditional F sharp minor. Yeah. But then I played a D flat kind of seventh. Oh yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, and it's and sharp a bit, 11. Yeah, and it's extended a bit because I felt like it needs an extension, just not two uh, measures. So mm-hmm. I think it's four measures. And yeah, and then there's this uh, riff that I came up with. I don't really know how I came up with. I think I was just... Uh, playing around uh, with uh, something I like. Lo- <laughs> I love this so much. Well. To me, it sounds like a uh, like all, uh, if the uh, if the first melody of the song just went into a different direction and became mm. a bass melody. Mm. Yeah, well, that was the idea that it's that, that there's a melody in the bass and there's this kind of a clave in the upper strings. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's. So it's just repeating. Mm. And then it goes. And then lands on a F sharp kind of sus something. <laughs> just a, yeah, I like this chord, how it sounds there. So, mm. and then it goes back to the... Uh, Melody to the flowers love something melody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's kind of the whole thing. It's uh, like this thing uh, of the 
this pattern that I just played, this interlude, and then just the melody. I don't know. And then, yeah, that's it. I also love that D7 sharp 9 in the end of the bridge. Um, sorry. And the, ah, okay, this one. Yeah. 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 There's more, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, yeah. yeah, it's yeah, it's because the last chord is the A flat seven, mm -hmm. a flat right. thir flat thirteen. So I just thought it would sound cool, Jimi yeah. Hendrixy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A bit. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, did you write this down for your for your musicians, or did did you show it to them like um, you showed me now, or? Oh, I wrote down. Uh, I think I wrote down some things first, just with a pen on a paper when I first uh, brought it to the rehearsal. And I think it was very confusing how I wrote it. So then I <laughs> put it in the computer and yeah, I, I wrote it down, but not like all the voicings per se and not the whole patterns that guitar plays, but more like a lead sheet, you know, mm -hmm. and just description of what happens where and Yeah, and then we worked in the rehearsal uh, on maybe like the arrangement and where does drums start playing and what kind of groove does drums play mm -hmm. and where does bass play the melody and what's the groove and stuff like this, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was in the rehearsals. Yeah, yeah. cool. Can you uh, go into detail a little bit on I Love You Porgy? Okay. Should I explain it? Or? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, it's it's just it's I think it's one of my favorite songs um, because I first heard it on a Bill Evans record, the Live at Village Vanguard, mm -hmm. and yeah, and I read this story back then. It was I was seventeen or something when I started uh, listening to this album, and yeah, I read the story that Bill Evans, I mean Scott LaFaro, you know that he died uh, like two weeks after the recording or mm -hmm. something like this. And I read somewhere that Bill Evans, after that, played this song always as a dedication to Scott LaFaro. And he played mm -hmm. it as a solo piece or something like this. And that to me was very like moving and I don't know, something, I really loved Bill Evans and everything he played to me was, I don't know, I felt so moved. And I remember I was listening to this, to this song and I don't know, Sometimes I get this with music, like a very, like a spiritual, uh, how to say, experience, you know, where it's, I don't know, it's just very emotional. Mm -hmm. And so I had this with that song and yeah, I've been in love with this song ever since. So yeah, I kind of wanted to play it and I learned it also back then from the Bill Evans recording and I transcribed the voicings and stuff, mm. which I can't uh, play anymore. So, and I was learning it for a long time, this song. So Were finally- Were you playing the voicings on the guitar? Sorry? Were you playing the voicings on the guitar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was really long time ago. I was 18 or something like this. Mm -hmm. And of course I had to, um, how to say, kind of, Uh, make the voicings smaller and change them a bit around because I couldn't play all those seconds, you know, when there's a mm -hmm. voicing of, I don't know, stacked thirds and there's a second suddenly on top, I can't do it. So I had to rearrange the voicings. Um, so yeah, and finally, I think two years ago or something like this, I came up with this more like an original version of the song and I finally felt like, okay, I can play it. I have my own thing to say on it a bit, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So That's the it. the version grew out of just the, the love for somebody else's version and the song itself. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, yeah. whenever you play it, it sounds like a completely new song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, could be maybe. I don't know. <laughs> can um, you can you um, let's take it apart a little bit the okay. the arrangement. Well, first of all, the idea was, again, to have open strings. Um, I came first up with these voicings, just, you know, because uh, just there's a lot. For example, the G can be open, left open for, I think, all of the chords and it fits somewhere. For 
for example, on the F major, it's it's the nine, and on the seventh, it's also really nice. And on the B flat major, it's also nice. Mm-hmm. For the G G minor, it's of course it's the root, but yeah, and the C seven. So it started first with this idea of the leaving the G string open. Mm-hmm. And it's I play it kind of as a pedal and tremolo. Should I play it? I don't know. Yeah. The intro. Okay. Yeah. And it's just I use also pull offs. I do it a lot where it's So this is the first section, mm-hmm. and the whole idea is just the G is always open, and then there's the chords, uh, you know, one moving to four and then etc., and having the pull-offs. So then often I leave also the D ringing and stuff, mm-hmm. and later on the idea is uh, to play the melody, mm-hmm. uh, but with pull-offs <laughs> again. Mm-hmm. I'm using the pull off so much. Yeah, and it's just So actually I'm playing this melody. But each time I play it I play a pull off. So the open string resonates. So And this idea then is moved again through the whole A section. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then sometimes I use something else like uh, on this D minor mm-hmm. I use this uh, ascending line of open strings and sometimes harmonics mm-hmm. uh, but but yeah Here, I usually play also cascading like this uh, line of open strings, which I got from Rainier Bass. So, mm. <laughs> shouldn't I shouldn't play it now. Uh, but Please yeah, that's it. <laughs> I hope I can do it. But yeah. So, so you're also yeah. there. You're ut- utilizing the open strings. Yeah. Which one of those is an open string? Can you play it slowly? Okay. So this is a A. These are not open strings, but then E is open string. Wait. Uh, so E is open. C sharp, then it's B is open, then B flat. Oh no. <laughs> I have to do it again. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's difficult, slow. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's uh, it's kind of a F scale, but uh, with these uh, alterations. So it's each time that uh, a note fits from the F scale. You know, it's E, is this uh, seventh, and then this is sharp eleven, this is nine, this is six, and this yeah. is just the third. So each time a note fits, I can just leave it open. Mm-hmm. Kind of, that's cool. That's very cool, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and convenient on the guitar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. So yeah, yeah. that's somebody, the intro. Somebody told me um, when uh, talked about bassists, upright bassists, mm-hmm. uh, he was just learning the bass and uh, he told me like, okay, so whenever there's a chance or a possibility to use an open string, most bases will use it mm-hmm. and take that opportunity yeah, yeah. and yeah, that yeah. helped me so much by also when i listen to bases i mm-hmm. i hear listen also for the the open strings or mm-hmm. in order to see where they are mm-hmm. to hear the pitches you know mm-hmm. so i yeah. by now i have a pretty good idea where yeah. e a d mm-hmm. and g are yeah. so i can quickly hear ah oh, okay there we are okay yeah that's which cool. helps with the yeah. bridge of i loves you porgy or mm-hmm. you know all those things so I guess with guitar it's the same because it gives you so much more uh, sound 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just, uh, yeah, all open strings always have just, it fills up the, I don't know, it just makes everything resonate longer and it just makes the sound rounder and stuff. And it's, I, I maybe, you know, I played like piano when I was younger, like until yeah. 16. So I always loved the sound of the pedal and, you know, the notes can stay long and... I guess open strings for me are a bit like this, you know, using the pedal on the piano kind of that. But you're using note. you're using the other pedal right now also. <laughs> you mean uh, the guitar pedal? The guitar like the, pedal where you mean the you, freeze <laughs> where you freeze the chord? Yeah. And there yeah. I'm always thinking, oh, Ella's playing piano. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, open strings are nice. So, but um. What happens for you then if you play in a key or in a song mm. where not many open strings are applicable right away? Mm. Yeah, then I probably don't play open strings. <laughs> 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 That's it, I guess. Yeah, it, it really depends on the song's key mm -hmm. and also the style of the song. You know, if I would be playing um, something fast and I don't know, then I probably wouldn't play open strings. Mm -hmm. So it depends very much on the style of the song and uh, yeah, the tempo, the, yeah, what I want to tell with the song, you know, the atmosphere mm -hmm. and stuff. When did you start using the freeze pedal? Um, I think two years ago. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I really like the sound of that. Uh, Yeah, it's it's cool, but it's sometimes it feels like a trap a bit. Or it's just very obvious when I press a low note or leave it as a drone, you know, an E drone, and then I start playing on top. I'm like, ah, oh, this is so obvious what I'm doing. And I don't know, but <laughs> so. But yeah. you could say that, you know, uh, I think we. C I know this voice. I know mm -hmm. this voice where, well, well, you know, yeah. oh, this is so obvious what I'm doing. Yes, on a technical side, yeah. maybe for some people, mm -hmm. for most people who don't know anything about music, it's not as obvious. Yeah. But um, you're not just doing technical things because you're doing something that moves people emotionally and they don't care how it's done, right? I mean, mm -hmm. at least that's what I'm, whenever you use it, I'm not, um, I'm not thinking, oh, Ella, I, I totally know what Ella is doing. Be, because usually you use it, you know, so musically mm -hmm. and so, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. In, so, in yeah. the perfect place somehow. Mm. Yeah, that's nice <laughs> to hear. I mean, of course, yeah, like people who are not musicians probably never think about these things, you know. So, yeah, so it's just, of course, all in the head and what, you know, other guitarists, uh, you, of course know what I'm doing or also you know what I'm doing and other musicians so it's just a, this thing of ex expectations on myself and yeah just that thing yeah how do you deal with with that voice uh, because everybody has it yeah. and everybody needs to deal with it so yeah what are you well, doing um yeah it's pretty difficult I guess it depends on the situations. I think from from at least how I used to be a few years back, now I'm way better at handling this critical voice and stuff. So I guess it's just a matter of accepting that it's just going to be there and not give so much strength to it or just not believe it always. That's a case for me that I know it's just going to be there and it's really hard to get rid of it, but it's not really necessary to believe all those critical things and, you know, fears and ideas. And for me, what helped, it's also writing down uh, just how I feel after concerts or oh, what I... Th a journal? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Great. just just write down what I think went wrong or what I think could be better. Also about recording and playing when I played in summer a small tour I was also writing down stuff okay this went wrong this went wrong blah 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 and all these critical things and it's good just to write them down and kind of 
okay, let it out. And maybe after a time I would read it and be I would uh, realize that it wasn't really true what I felt mm. and stuff like this. So for me, it's just, you know, I know it's really hard to get rid of this voice. So, yeah, it's a matter of accepting and not giving it so much power, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. It can really take on yeah. uh, such a power and such a grip on us also. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Would you I also mean, write down the positive things or only, only the negative things? <laughs> no, I write down, write, write down also positive things. Uh, for example, what happens yeah, in concerts. But I think mostly I write, write down these critical things because of the positive things I'm always grateful and I feel happy about them in my heart. So I don't feel like I have to write them down because... It's just a positive thing already, so I rather try to get rid of the negative things, kind of. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm. I think you're. You probably know way more about this and how to handle this and stuff. So. I don't know. I mean, I think for me it's a comforting th thought in a way that everybody mm. deals with it, yeah. even a person who is working in the bakery. Yeah. Or you know, it's not just limit to us as musicians or jazz musicians is like everybody exactly. has it and all the non-musicians have it as well in in human mm. interaction everybody wants to be seen and loved yeah. and uh, taken seriously and uh, what what stands uh, in front of that or in the way of that is usually most most of the time ourselves, you know yeah we want to be taken seriously but we don't take ourselves yeah. seriously or too seriously at times you know i just love doing these interviews and talking to the people about that because uh, to me it's also a comforting th thought that um not only ella or pablo deal with this but also john Schofield, you know mm. Yeah. And everybody has everybody has this thing, yeah. you know. Yeah. Were there any people um, particularly who gave you great advice in that regard? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, I guess from time to time, uh, the teachers that I have at the conservatorium, some things they've said really um, have helped. Or even, for example, Tineke Posma, you know, uh, Tineke Posma, amazing saxophonist. She, I think I told her once that I was afraid to ask people to play with me, you know. Mm. I was like, I really didn't want to ask people I think are way, way too good for me to play with you know there's so much better and she said that i really should do it and i shouldn't be afraid and that she also just asked people she really admired and she was a bit scared to ask and she, she was like just go for it you know there's nothing mm -hmm. to lose and stuff like this so i mean it's a bit different from what you asked but this actually helped me also a lot to kind of step over this uh, feeling of not being worthy to play with people I admire, you know? Yes. So that was a great thing she said to me. Like mm -hmm. A very small thing, but it's, you know, you know, it changes things. So. Yeah. And we learn so much when yeah. we be when we're around people who are, uh, you know, uh, a little bit more experienced than yeah. I, uh, we yeah. are. Or if we're like, if we're the worst person <laughs> or the worst <laughs> musician in the room, that's always great. Because then we can see, oh, she's doing it that way, or he's doing mm -hmm. it that way, and oh, maybe I should try too. Or, mm. yeah, totally. That's great advice. Mm. Yeah, Tina is great, huh? Yeah, yeah, she is. What was it like to work with her on the record? It was really great. I mean, she's super professional. You know, she can. We rehearsed once before. And, you know, she sees the sheath and it's quite difficult, at least, I think. And she just plays it, you know, it's really, I don't know, she's super professional. And um, 
I love how she plays also the soprano saxophone. Yes. So that was especially why I wanted to really for her to play on the record because for Dernosi I really heard the soprano and mm. she was she's perfect for that. So yeah, and she played an amazing solo and each takes were really amazing. And she's very kind and very nice person. So it was really easy to work with her and yeah, I'm really super happy to have her on the album. She's really great, so yeah. mm. and she also there's one moment where she doubles the melody. Yeah. Yeah. It's really nice how it goes together with your yeah. voice because it's yeah, like yeah. the same range and also mm -hmm. somehow she she kind of um works nicely together with with the sonorities of your voice. Mm -hmm. Really works well together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, for her it's also I only had a lead sheet for this song, so you know, all those fills and playing together with the melody was her choice. So she did really great with that, you know, choosing where mm -hmm. to play and where to leave space. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's this one moment in her solo where she kind of goes uh, to a different galaxy. I don't know what yes. you, uh, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think I know before the there's this repeating choruses and there's this last chorus and she yeah. really she plays outside. I think yeah. ha half step up or something. I don't know. I didn't transcribe it yet, but it's like, whoa, what's yes. happening? It's so yeah. Good, yeah, it's a great mm. moment. Yeah. Because you you see clearly, and you see the road, and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're like, whoa, what what's <laughs> yeah. happening here? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. We have to ask her about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I saw now that you're playing with different kind of trio setups, like a lot yeah. of different bands. So what's yeah, ha what's true. happening there? Like you are you okay. forming a new trio, or um, mm, no. are you working on other stuff, or? No, the thing is that like uh, I had a staple band, you know, uh, with bass and drums, uh, the trio, and the bass player, uh, he's called David Macchione. He went to study in Berkeley for this year. So, yeah, it's like the trio doesn't exist, you know, the original yeah. trio doesn't exist at the moment. So for me, it felt, I don't know, I didn't feel it would be right to have a to make a new band with a new bass player and mm -hmm. kind of r substitute him and completely make a new band and play for a year because mm -hmm. it would be strange then to because this new bass player would have played with us for a year and then we go back to that it would be weird so this year i'm just playing all the time with uh, different bass players and drummers i really love and they're playing so it was also very I don't know, I wanted to give myself this uh, kind of challenge and it's uh, it's just a great experience to play with different rhythm sections. I always have to play differently depending mm -hmm. on the, for example, drummer or bassist. It's really, it changes a lot my playing and the dynamics I have to in what I play and just the language. So it's also very fun just you know, as a growing and learning experience to play in different settings. So, yeah. What has it shown you um, about your own songs? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Difficult question. Uh, mm, I guess that... I mean... Some of my songs can be played, I think, in very just different kind of a. I don't know. They're very clear the songs, but I think it's very easy just to find space to play on them because they're not very particular. Uh, I don't know. There's not a particular drum groove written out or something. So I always leave a open space for the drummer to mm -hmm. just choose what he wants to do there. So I I would hope and say that my songs invite the people to play whatever yeah. they th uh, would want to play on that songs. And yeah, I hope so. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But also I learn a lot about my own playing. It's like when I play with louder drummers or louder bass players, I, you know, I see where I'm like not good at playing maybe loud or something that would fit in more with how the rhythm section is playing. So 
I'm also seeing a lot of uh, flaws in my own playing. So that's also cool to work mm. on different stuff than I would work on. So mm. it's very nice. Yeah. Yeah. I think it also shows you a lot about how you write down your music mm. when you put it, put it in front of different people. Yeah. And then you see, okay, everybody is doing the same mistake at the same <laughs> time. Maybe <laughs> I should have put this bar mm. on the next page so mm. we don't have this kind of thing going, mm. you know. Yeah, or also. Um, everybody's inter interpreted, interpreting that in a way where I think it doesn't really suit the song. So maybe, or everybody's doing the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, that can sometimes mean also like, maybe that section isn't so natural mm -hmm. to most people. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I should change it, you know? Mm. Yeah, too. I recently had a thing where like, there's a I wrote a long song and on page four there is a completely new section after a solo mm -hmm. section and I wanted to have that section in a, in a different manner mm -hmm. played in a different manner and it never happened the way I envisioned it to mm -hmm. to sound like and it's like yeah maybe if everybody's doing it if everybody doesn't anticipate the thing that I want to hear there Maybe either I should be more, you know, strict in how I write it down or rethink my initial idea because it maybe it doesn't just it doesn't yeah. feel like going there. Yeah, also too. Yeah. And I'm just saying this because I think you find out these things when you put your music in front of different people mm -hmm. and then you have a range of reactions to your thoughts mm -hmm. and ideas to compare, you know. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I'm I'm looking forward to hearing you with different people as well. I, you're playing with my trio. You're playing with my bassist and drummer. <laughs> oh, I'm stealing your band. No, oh, no, I that's I, fine. I, I actually fe I actually felt like, oh no, I'm stealing Pablo's <laughs> trio. <laughs> I hope no, that's not. fine. I hope it's uh, no, no, all good. <laughs> okay. I'd love to hear the gig. I'm yeah. I'm not in town, but um, yeah. are you playing the material from the record or what's yeah. happening? Yeah, we're playing some songs from the record. Yeah, because you know it came out like a month ago. So, yeah, I'm playing some gigs here and there just to kind of play the music and maybe someone likes it and listens to it. I don't know, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah, with Robert and Jonas, we played in the Standards Week, right? So yeah, they're so great. I mean. They're amazing. So mm -hmm. I, I was also really scared to ask them to play, but yeah, I did it. So I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. I'm glad you had Tinika's voice in your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that's a common thing. You know, people are afraid to ask the people that they would love to play with. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Because w what do we fear? We fear like rejection. Also, yeah. I'm not going to play with you, Ella. Mm. <laughs> Who's going to yeah. say that, Ella? I mean, I mean, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a complicated thing, I guess, this fear. Yeah. 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 Maybe, maybe you could go into detail about um, some more personal heroes of yours that mm -hmm. inspired you on the guitar and what you took from them. Mm or what you admire about them. Mm. Okay. Well, um, my first hero, I'm going to talk about my one of my first heroes was actually Jim Hall, which I previously said, I think that I can't sound like him. But I was definitely trying to sound like him when I was 17 or 18. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he was my first hero. And I first discovered him on Undercurrent, because oh, yeah. I was, you know, I was in love with Bill Evans, so of course mm -hmm. I listened to his rec records. And yeah, that record was so great. And I was listening to it for at least a month, like every day on repeat, wherever I went. So what to me uh, was the most important in this record, or just the way Jim Hall played there, it's just he's so melodic. And mm -hmm. it always felt like he's almost singing. It's like, it felt like he's singing and I could... Um, hear those solos in my head and sing along with them mm. and they were so memorable and like just everything made sense the notes seemed like they're in the right places or I don't know very musical mm -hmm. so that's the first thing I really loved uh, from Jim Hall 
and also his later records. Uh, there's this live in Toronto record where he plays uh, Scrapple from the Apple. Yes. And it's, it, it's so cool. And it's yeah. like he plays all these. I don't know that he's so playful in his improvisations and he's exploring stuff and I don't know, playing his own thing. And it's always very groovy and it's never too much technical and never mm -hmm. too much. I don't know. It's like perfect. And some people like have said that he has didn't have amazing technique, but I think he's so amazing. And even there's a recording of my Fanny Valentine with the Levens where he plays all these sweeps and it's in really incredible. So mm. they I play it quite fast, right? Yeah, yeah, also. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, Jim Hall, really uh, my first <laughs> favorite guitarist mm -hmm. and one of the like uh, strongest influences in the beginning. Um, but I think. Uh, Sorry. Can I interrupt you just for one moment? Yeah. Like there's, um, was it the Brazilian song that you play? Mm. Yeah. There's a rhythm that you play on the guitar to set up the song ah, okay. that totally reminds me of Jim Hall and the way he kind of plays straight, uh, straight eighth songs. Okay. Mm, you did it also at Clang. You played, you played that. Um, what's what's the The Tristeza, the Brazilian song? I or? think so, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Okay. And the way you set it up, okay. strumming the chords, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. totally reminded me of Jim Hall's yeah. way of, of playing on uh, the bridge by Sonny Rollins. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he is also, Jim Hall is really great at strumming and it's always so powerful. And also in those yeah. duo settings, it's always, he's like a motor that is going and the rhythm is so good, always, it's perfect. Uh, Can you explain this this rhythm or uh, show it? Ah, okay. Yeah. Because I, feel I like think it's it's very specific. It's very. Um, um, I think it didn't <laughs> sound like Jim Hall, at least to me. But maybe it actually does. I mean, I don't know. Is it like? Uh, is it this one? Ah, uh, sorry. Yeah, it's just a... Da, 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 yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's I guess it's just this one strumming pattern. Mm -hmm. And then there's... Yeah, a bass line moving. Yeah. And very simple, just strumming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. So, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think some of this I got from Rainier Bass. Mm -hmm. So, also, because he plays uh, some Brazilian stuff, I think, a bit in his own way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you were just uh, talking about personal heroes. Maybe yeah. I, I interrupted you, so no. maybe you can con continue. Yeah, I I feel like I don't have so many particularly very strong guitarists that have changed my world. Mm -hmm. uh, but I love many guitarists. But it just like people who have changed my world are in so many. But actually, I was really obsessed with Lenny Burrow. Do you know this guitarist? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, with the harp harmonic thing. I was obsessed for a while. Uh, that was seven years ago mm -hmm. but that was a strong influence for a time because i was also playing quite a lot back then uh without a pick and with uh, you know finger picking so that was an important influence and of course since now i've moved to amsterdam for the past more than five years of course the guitarists here have been a very big influence on me especially like yes when ruler his playing really influenced me i think and I was listening to his records a lot, so mm -hmm. he's also a big influence on me. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk uh, about how it was to uh, study with him? I mean, it was great, you know, uh, but uh, we played a lot. Mm -hmm. It uh, We played a lot of songs. It's, you know, going to the lessons and you bring a song or you write something and you play it. And it's, it's in the school, it's a lot like this uh, kind of learning 
by playing. Uh, it's not so much talking about, okay, we can play this there, 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 mm -hmm. and stuff like this. It's more you go and play and you learn from that. And I think it's a great method, uh, you know, to hear how he plays and how, you know, he even picks or what does his attack sound like. And yeah, it's a great thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Do you remember some kind of comments that he had on uh, some pieces of advice? Oh. Uh, it feels like it was such a long time ago huh? mm -hmm. um, I have to think it's been already two years since mm -hmm. I had my last lesson with him um, actually he was just very positive and encouraging also that mm. was very nice um, that just someone says yeah it sounds good you know mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really it's I don't know I didn't get it so often so it it was really cool you know to when someone just says yeah, just do your thing, go forward. Yeah, and keep on doing it. Yeah, 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 and mm -hmm. that's really, that's really great. That I think it was also nice that he was never, he never told to me, yeah, you should do this, or this is the way you should play and stuff. So I was always very welcomed to just play how I feel I should play, you know. And it's I think as long as you have a strong vision of how you want to play and what you have to say on the song, he was happy. So I think that's really great, you know, mm. that they, the teachers here don't try to force you to play in a certain way. Yeah, so. that's good. Yeah. How do you learn a song? Like when you learn a standard, what's your process? Okay, um, so it depends <laughs> on the song. If it's an easier song, then it's more straightforward, you know, listening to a recording of it and then just playing along with it or finding a score, you know, and then checking out the chords, if it's the right chords, and then learning the bass notes, the chords, the melody. It's really important for me always to know the melody. Otherwise, I feel like I can't improvise over the song. Mm -hmm. But for more difficult songs, um, I remember I was learning Satellite and then it's just, you know, I kind of even write down all these things that I need to learn on a song before I can, like, play it well. It's just I was practicing, you know, playing one, like, uh, the roots of the chords, and then I'm playing the root and the third and then the third and the fifth. So I can also hear it and sing it along with those notes, and I'm just playing those notes. And afterwards, I'm trying to play motifs from the those notes. And then I go to seven arpeggios, and then I try to connect motifs, and then I try to play like longer <laughs> lines, ascending or descending. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's so it depends on the song. That was if a it, lot, Ella. That sorry. was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's like Kay. I really, yeah. Sorry. It would be great if you could show it. Ah, on satellite. Mm -hmm. Oh God, will it sound like a. It will sound like a terrible exercise, <laughs> but I think it's, I mean, it's for this song, it's just really hard to just see a sheet and just suddenly, if you haven't played Culture and Change, it's like, I, I can't just suddenly play amazing stuff. Yeah. So first I was just, you know, also just to hear the harmony, I was just playing or something, you know, just do it again. So <laughs> you play the one and the three and then yeah. the next. Yeah. One, three. Yeah. One, three. That's a good terrible. exercise. No, I Sorry. think I think it sounds great. I'm already hearing the song, you know. Oh yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. And then it's you know you can always change around the direction. You can uh, play it on a different uh, part of the beat. You know you don't have to start it on the one. You can start it on the off beat or something, and then you just can play a motive. <laughs> sounds terrible don't say it Ella it sounds great it just, it just sounds so like shreddy and so like oh this is my exercise but it's I think it's good to sometimes do these things that are less musical in order to be able to do musical things I and totally agree but I think those things sound there's truth to the, what you what you're playing there mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. think it sounds great I think it it resembles the harmony mm -hmm. and you know yeah. You're working on a motive. That's great, you know. Yeah. Could you play the... Uh, I, uh, now I want to hear how it sounds if you displace the, the third. I mean, with the three, if you go down, just in comparison um, to the first exercise you did. Uh, sorry? So... 
like mm. one and then take mm -hmm. the three but down so i play a three back three down from the root or or wait no, i so play yes <laughs> okay okay uh, i'll no, do it no actually no 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 i mean uh, starting on the one so you uh -huh. play one uh -huh. and then you play the third of that chord but go downwards not ah. upwards that's it oh. and then that's that that's that's cool yeah i actually didn't practice this <laughs> option <laughs> do it again please do it again <laughs> okay wait 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 okay I'm doing it super slow, sorry. It's good. Um, uh, mm -hmm. And how does it sound if you play, because the, the next, mm -hmm. if you play one and go down for the three, the next one is just a half step away. Oh, wow. You see? Oh, nice. Thank you. <laughs> New exercises. <laughs> no, I, I just thought of that because yeah, yeah. yeah it's so it's so near and it sounds mm -hmm. so um, yeah, yeah. near when you play it upwards. Yeah, but yeah. if you play yeah, it yeah. downwards, yeah. there's a different. It yeah, does yeah. something to the melody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, that's yeah, that's I think for this song, songs that are complicated, it's easy to take like these small things because when it's just one interval, you immediately like see okay, this is the third, but then it goes to the one, and it's you see all these connections. And then it's, I think for me, it's at least easier to take small things and then build yes. bigger things from that. So mm -hmm. I try to do that for standards when I learn them. Yeah. yeah. For me, it was very cool to see uh, when I was learning a song like Satellite, mm -hmm. uh, then to see if I play these things, what you just played, but don't play mm -hmm. it on Satellite, but on a pedal. Mm. Like Coltrane does, oh, yeah. when he's yeah. playing like modal stuff, yeah, yeah. he is also playing a superimposing Coltrane yeah, changes yeah. at times over mm -hmm. D minor, mm -hmm. or in freeze settings. Even if you hear mm -hmm. him on uh, Interstellar Space, you know the mm -hmm. later records, he's still playing that sequence. Yeah, um, yeah. And it already sounds like super complex and and out there if you just play it on top of one thing. Mm. And yeah, in yeah. the song, it sounds so inside all the time, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It's, it's mm -hmm. weird how the perspective changes when you put something in a different mm -hmm. environment. Yeah. Nice. What are the, what is the last piece of music that really, really touched you that you wanted to learn also? Actually. I wanted to learn some Ravel pieces, <laughs> mm, nice. but I couldn't, but it was already like a, at least a month ago, but I was really touched by the music and I wanted to learn this piece. It has like this, I think, A flat pedal. It's in free for if I, it's called uh, something for Borodin. I oh, a la manière de yeah, Borodin. Yes, 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 exactly. That's yeah, great. I, it's so pretty. It's mm -hmm. so beautiful. So I wanted to learn that, but yeah, I... I think like the majority of it could be played on a guitar. Yeah, yeah. I started learning it uh, a bit. I checked out the first uh, page, but I could play it like very slowly. <laughs> and I think I didn't have the time to fully commit and uh, learn it properly. So I just checked the voicings and some stuff. And I think actually I stole a bit, I, at least some ideas from one piece I played. But yeah, I don't know. Do so you want to show it? No. <laughs> No, <laughs> I, th I think it was on. Uh, I played these etudes in the cl clang set, and mm -hmm. I had this also A flat pedal for one song where I had this diminished chord going to this different chord, and that part also was in free four. So I feel like I stole it actually subconsciously. Some That's I don't fine. know. <laughs> we all steal. Yeah. Is that saying that you know St uh, Stravinsky said a great composer doesn't uh, borrow; he steals. Mm. Mm. Okay. And I always think like if you have, if you steal something, it's yours. Mm. But if you borrow something, you have to give it back. Yeah. And it's not really yours yet, mm. you know, but if you really take something, you're also going to put it in a different environment, you know, mm -hmm. like in a Ella Sirena et etude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you, if you just borrow it, then it's like a gimmick. Mm. But if you steal it, and take it to your place, to your <laughs> world, 
it becomes something that is really part of you. So I think all the great composers are stealing. Yeah. Skriabin, what, what does Skriabin yeah. mean to you? Because yeah. he's, he's a favorite of mine too. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Skriabin. Yeah. I don't know. It's also, it's been a while. I was really into his music when I was also 18 or something like that until 20 or 21. And Skriabin to me, I don't even know why uh, his music just really resonated with me. The first uh, piece I heard from his was the first symphony. Mm. And like the first movement, the lento movement. I don't know, I just heard it and it's so beautiful. There's just this one melody with like these big jumps and then the strings are playing super long chords. And it almost sounds like a pedal, but the, the harmonies, it's just E sus, I think, first. And yes, it's an E, move, yes. Yeah. yeah, and then moves to a minor and then suddenly it goes somewhere else. And it's all the time so surprising. And it's it, maybe this, I don't know, this music just made me very emotional or something. It made me feel a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Or just, I was very, I don't know, it drew me really in. And and then later on, I listened to the uh, piano preludes and etudes and stuff. I had mm -hmm. this all, this discography uh, downloaded of all the works played. Uh, mm -hmm. I was, I think I really liked this piano sonata three mm -hmm. and five also. And, and it's like, I don't know actually why his music resonated with me so much i don't mm -hmm. know it's really hard to know but it's just very beautiful mm -hmm. and it's always surprising and the motifs he uses and the melodies and how he orchestrates the piano and everything yeah it's really beautiful and sometimes it's even simple but sometimes it's super complex so that's what i love about him he's very i don't know very there's many there's many things it's it's just he doesn't have just this one style it's like he was very much evolving all the time so, mm -hmm. yeah yeah i also want to know more about him as a person yeah because at the end of his life i think he had some very uh out there ideas mm -hmm. about everything um yeah like he was into the big mystery or something he was mm -hmm. almost uh, st started a cult And, yeah, um, yeah. His if his later works also seem like somebody who's really <laughs> searching for something new yeah. and mm. something uh, grander than mm. bigger than yeah. himself or his environment. Yeah. You probably know this story about he how he wanted this big concert in the Himalayas or something where yeah. there would be this big festival. Yeah, it's pretty ooh. pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What was he smoking? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty interesting. Yeah, when I uh, when you showed me your um, seventh etude, mm -hmm. there's some moments which remind me of him and his yeah. harmonies. Mm -hmm. There's, I, I think there's this one section where you go from C sus to C seven sharp eleven or something. Yeah, definitely. That's right. yeah. I already thought so. I was like playing it. I was like, oh, this is a bit scrabbing something. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's also this chord, which how ah. how um, how does he call it? Like yeah. from the top to bottom, it's 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 like great the, because it's six notes. Is it like the is it like the, where yes, the sharp, that's yeah, it. sharp 11 and the 13 and the 9? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Cool. That's it. <laughs> Always reminds me of him. Yeah. Cool. And there's a section in the etude where you go from G, G major seven sharp eleven to yeah. E flat seven yeah. sharp yeah. nine, yeah. and that's such a great sec. You know, mm -hmm. why does it go so well into each other? And also, when you then transpose it to F major F. Yeah. and C sharp altered yeah. or uh, um, yeah. seven sharp nine that's such a great sequence i want to play over that all the time i used to <laughs> you know uh, before the interview I, i was playing along with it and it's oh, really okay. inviting for improvisation mm. it's really yeah, so oh, cool. oh yeah. i would re really love to hear you play over it <laughs> okay i can send you a recording <laughs> okay but um yeah that's that's my favorite section mm. of that song 
That's really cool. How do you look at those chords? I mean, how do you put them into context with each other? Um, I, ah, this is going to sound bad, but I don't know. It's, I think it's just, I also came up with this. I mean, it's pretty obvious sequence, but I came up with it by year. I was just playing, you know, what makes sense uh, when I hear it, you know? So I wasn't really thinking about, okay, this should go to Discord or something. Mm -hmm. And obviously when it goes to G, ma it's G major, E flat seven, and then it's F major. D flat seven. Yeah. So it's just a sequence. So I feel like it, it's always going to make sense if it's a sequence. Uh, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's also, also voice leading. Because when I think of it, like the first chord, G major seven sharp eleven. Ah. If you change one note of that and yeah. exchange it to E flat. Yeah. And I think it's because I had this melody when I played it, the melody goes which it lands on like a G and F sharp, which is the root and then the, the seven. And then I just leave it, you know? And then I just yes. leave it. And it's it's becomes E flat seven. Uh, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. And also E flat seven. <laughs> can work as a dominant towards f majors yeah. f major you know yeah yeah perfect <laughs> yeah. well that's how i thought about it yeah. i was curious about what you yeah. think yeah i mean definitely this yeah. yeah will you play this with the uh, with robert and jonas um oh i could try actually i haven't tried it with the band yet but it's i want to actually do it so Maybe yeah, I will. Maybe I, will. I think I think it could work very well, and those guys would play it. You know, okay. it would sound great. Yeah. Also with the with the five eight and the you know yeah. those yeah. intricate things, mm. it could be something that could be explored with a band. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. So, what's next? I mean, we talked about the hurdle of the first record, mm. and usually by. What I did was I quickly made the next or wanted to make the next one quickly. So I didn't yeah. think so much about, okay, what was the first album? You know, mm -hmm. if you just keep on uh, documenting your work and uh, the things that you discover along the way, mm -hmm. it's not so much set in stone everything because mm -hmm. the next thing will come along quickly. Yeah. Are you planning on doing something new or? Actually, actually, I was uh, now <laughs> I had this idea of maybe doing a small record, uh, like a solo record. I don't know. Uh, but Yeah, maybe solo because I was working on it a bit now, but it's just an idea. But yeah, I want to do a new record also. Kind of I feel like also I'm, I have already outgrown the songs I recorded uh, in the mm -hmm. previous record and I want to now play new songs and work on new material. So mm -hmm. I definitely feel like uh, doing that, but it's also now I'm in this period where I don't have a, like a stable trio. And I'm also now, uh, I think maybe I should play with maybe another harmony instrument or I'm trying to figure out a new lineup or I just, don't, I, I'm just experimenting also a bit, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and playing more in different bands where I'm not actually the band leader, which is nice. So, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would love to hear a solo album of yours. <laughs> yes. Okay. That would be so great. Cool. Thanks. Uh, just also just hearing you live at Clang, mm -hmm. the solo uh, set was just incredible. I really loved yeah. it. Thank and you, you have so many things also <laughs> like some, the etudes and the black is the color and you, mm. that's not on the record mm. that you could that you could easily just do yeah so yeah maybe wow, i'm looking forward to that <laughs> solo playing is something that really for me is like was and still is to a certain extent scary yeah but it surely doesn't sound like that when i listen to you oh. it sounds like super effortless and and um you sound at ease and you sound like you're comfortable but you're still stre stretching and finding new things so and for uh above all it sounds like um self-sufficient like you can 
you can actually <laughs> that's something i'm struggling with you just play music just by your own that's solo playing you have to come up with all the music on your own and it's not like you're still imagining a different mm -hmm. player in the back that supports yeah. you no you have to support yourself yeah so um what did you do so um that helped you accomplish that um to be honest i like feel when i'm playing solo i feel like it's not good and it's i don't feel like i don't feel like all these things i i mean i just don't feel that way how you just described my playing i don't feel that way myself so mm -hmm. i feel like i'm not feeling up the space well enough or i'm just struggling actually <laughs> when i'm playing solo but it's nice that you're saying these positive things uh which again probably means that the things i imagine in my head aren't true you know and it sounds different to the listener um but I mean, solo playing, it's still a new thing for me. Um, so I guess it's, again, I'm choosing the repertoire that I'm really comfortable with. And I feel like I have things to say on these songs and they're meaningful songs to me. And uh, for solo, I always try to think about uh, contrast between songs and uh, yeah contrast and how i can utilize the guitar it's you know i'm gonna maybe play with pull-offs or just change the sound of the pickups you know use bridge pickup or stuff like this um but i think i'm not answering your question <laughs> and you asked me something that's else, fine actually. Mm. so yeah i'm actually yeah still in the process of feeling comfortable playing alone but uh, this solo that i did in cologne last felt already better but it's what i struggle with it's to completely feel um to feel very much present because sometimes i so, uh, noticed myself thinking too much or mm. you know i'm playing this chord and i was very very aware of which chord am i playing or i thought okay don't mess up this thing next otherwise everybody's gonna hear it you know you're known mm -hmm. and stuff and also the thing about pedals you know feeling a you know, if I'm going to press something wrong, it's going to mess up. So there's, it's really hard to let go of all these things and to be very present. So, yeah, I guess it's also a matter of just performing solo and uh, just experiencing uh, it more and uh, having the experience yeah, of playing it mm -hmm. more and more. Yeah. And you're also playing everything by heart. Yeah. Which helps. Yeah, yeah with yeah. being more in the moment and yeah, at yeah. ease but how do you get the songs in so that are they are you know that you know them by heart mm. Mm. well if it comes to my compositions i always first learn them by heart <laughs> before i play them so that's just the thing i always do um but with other songs also before you write them down yeah <laughs> interesting yeah it's weird maybe no I it is it's not uh, i i don't um, think it's weird yeah i don't know because i always like to play my music by heart i don't know um but with other songs i guess the songs i play are very simple so learning them by heart it just doesn't take much time so yeah it's just, uh, again, a matter of finding recordings of the song that you're going to perform and uh, listening to it and trying to maybe imitate a bit the player. If you really love the player, I try sometimes to imitate or, uh, for example, Baden Powell, when I was playing this uh, Brazilian song, I'm just trying to steal some chords or maybe to try to at least uh, uh, kind of imitate a bit the feel mm -hmm. uh, with which he plays the chords. So it's a matter of that for those songs just listening and kind of playing a lot of course the song mm. to feel comfortable with it so yeah how is it for you to play standards in different keys uh, um it's something i should do way more <laughs> <laughs> because i don't do it so often and actually i was doing it yesterday i had a lesson with rainier bass and it was super fun 
and it's you know a song suddenly sounds so different when you play it in a different key which one and did you play we played the the man i love mm -hmm. you know very beautiful song yes so yeah i should do it way more because yeah i always choose a key that i like a song in or i play it in the key that everyone plays it in and mm -hmm. yeah i should really work on this more because it opens up ears and you know it's yeah it's a good thing to have also because when I play with singers or anyone plays with singers, it's good to be prepared and be, mm -hmm. to be able, you know, to just immediately switch keys. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Should work yeah, I'd be it. curious, <laughs> like, um, I love the Porgy, that arrangement mm -hmm. that utilizes so many open strings. Yeah. What could be a, a cool key to play it in where you get a different note mm -hmm. than the ninth of the, you know? Yeah that still yeah. works on uh, yeah. like that's like All a little puzzle question maybe mm -hmm. what would be a cool you know key yeah. to play it in uh, so we get it the same note mm -hmm. maybe the fifth what would happen if it's the fifth um you mean c major or if it's yeah, the fifth yeah, open yeah yeah i mean the if the open string mm -hmm. is the fifth a uh, fifth of a uh, f major you mean uh, or just the key yeah ah then c major then uh, then it would be c mm. major right yeah yeah if you use the g mm. i guess it would be a more a bit more difficult mm -hmm. I, I don't know it's I, I interesting will, i will actually look into this okay yeah <laughs> it's very interesting yeah yeah i like i like to ask myself these questions you know okay yeah. this works now but okay yeah. can i find a different yeah. way to make it work in a different key mm -hmm. or in a different setting yeah. uh, that would give me more options than mm -hmm. and then also give me more options for when i come back to the original key i will then have more things in place or in, in yeah. the areas where i could go into mm -hmm. um yeah um, okay, um, black is the color. There's mm -hmm. this one moment. It's sort of a climax moment and you reach mm -hmm. like a very, very interesting chord, I think. Also utilizing open strings. Yeah. Du, yeah. Du, 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 you know? Yeah. Uh -huh yeah maybe you can play the whole thing and we can stop at that that moment <laughs> and look at um, that chord okay then i have to tune the guitar i fine? see yeah of course it's, it's just a bit it's a uh, it's again like a a bit it's just a, dro a drop d and then instead of the b it's an a so it's very simple i think <laughs> I hope I hear everything because when you play, I frankly don't yeah. hear everything. You're, you're probably not gonna hear anything. <laughs> um, is it is it in the is it in the first melody or do you know which place it is? Or I'm not sure which place you need. Play play the melody, just the melody for me. Not so much, no. It helps when you sing along because then I hear your voice. There, yeah. In, at Clang, you kind of uh, um, ah. reached it with like, it was an intense moment, like ah, with okay. a lot of energy. Okay. Yeah. But just yeah. That, that, I love that chord so much. It's ah. so open as... Also, maybe because the voice leading goes... Like, I don't know, maybe that's... But yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. What is it? Do you have a low six there also in, in the? But also like one more note. Yeah, I'm playing, but I'm also playing. That's it. <laughs> what is it? Like the, that's the ninth. Um, or the I sixth. guess it's an A. So, so it's making this big crash, but I kind of like it. Yes. Can you name all the yeah. pitches? Um, okay, I have to think now because it's, it's a bit different tuning. But uh, this is, I think, a B flat, a G, and this is a A. So I guess it's the for the minor, it's the ninth. Right, and this, ninth. And, yeah. And this then is a F. No. Oh no! Oh, sorry, it's not a. Uh, it's a G. Yeah, I think. For me, it's very hard now because I don't oh. hear everything. Ah, it's a G. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. It's only three notes. It's almost a yeah. cluster, but they're yeah, yeah. spread apart. Yeah. I think you have a minor ninth then there, right? Like a. Yeah, 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 minor ninth. But this, like, the thing with the G and A, that it's a second, so it's making. But yes. Then the G is doubled an octave higher, so. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, if you have a, if you have a gig with somebody else's group, how do you usually prepare for a gig? Um, yeah, um, so again, it, I guess it depends on, are you now talking like it would be a band and a band playing original music or, mm -hmm. or something? Okay, then it's probably um, first of all, it's important, I think, to know what the vision of the leader is. If there's a leader, maybe it's a group where everybody's, you know, equally mm -hmm. important. So it's just important to have uh, empathy and kind of uh, understanding for the person who kind of leads the band. And it's important to understand his vision for the music. And also what I do is I ask for example, what guitarist the person likes or how does he want me to come? So it's, I just try to get information <laughs> from the musician of what he likes and try to understand him, you know? Mm. So that's important. And then with the music, uh, I like to learn it also by heart, at least if I'm playing, you know, festivals or bigger concerts, I think it's mm -hmm. really important to learn by heart especially because I feel that way, way more closer also to the music. Yes. And it's easy. It's so way, it's so much easier to play and to listen to everybody. And yeah, I don't know if that's also an important thing for me. Mm -hmm. So I would say those two things are really important mm -hmm. uh, to kind of, you know, empathize, uh, still treat the music uh, with a lot of respect and, you know, you're there to give it all to the music that you can. And yeah, it's just really important to also ask the musicians what they think about how your, you know, if your vision fits with their vision, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, so you're on the same page kind of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in a project where you're involved with, um, do you, what has to happen? Or, I mean, what has to be in place so that you feel comfortable and can give your best? Mm. Well, I think it, there's a lot of things that comes from within, of course, just that I feel confident in myself, that, you know, I'm able to play these songs. I feel comfortable on the stage. I feel grounded. There's, of course, these things uh, that come from within. Um, from what for what I need, like uh, to feel comfortable, actually, I guess. Um, I really like to play with people where I feel that they listen to what I'm doing, you know. I, I, it's really hard when just everybody's doing their own thing, it mm -hmm. can be super cool, and that I really have to adapt that to them, but it's. I guess I don't really like to be pushed so much in a certain direction, so I really like when people are also empathetic and uh, 
empathize with what I'm doing and there's kind of this group effort, you know, yeah. that everybody listens to each other. So that's something I need uh, to feel comfortable. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing, actually. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Ella, I think I have to go. Yeah. Yeah. But thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, this thank was you. this was really cool. Yeah.